ألف لام را كتاب أنزلناه إليك لتخرج الناس من الظلمات إلى النور إلى النور بإذن ربهم إلى صراط العزيز الحميد بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين ونصلي ونسلم على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين المبعوث رحمة للعالمين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما يا رب العالمين As always we begin with the praise of Allah Jalla Jalaluh and sending peace and blessings upon his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and upon his family and his companions and upon all those who follow them until the last day. Once again, I find myself here in Dudley, mashallah, tabarakallah, and every time I come here, honestly, it makes, me, it makes me very, very happy. This is really an amazing center and mashallah, you, you have some amazing uh, brothers here, mashallah, tabarakallah. Where else will I get an introduction like the introduction the Imam just gave me there, Allah will stand. Um, mashallah, tabarakallah, it is a really lovely place to come to and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to continue to give the brothers the tawfiq to do what pleases him and to continue to give them the ability to serve the community here. Alhamdulillah, the topic that we have today is a topic that is, subhanallah, a very important topic. And in reality, this comes under those kinds of things that Hudayfa radiallahu an used to ask the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam about. And there is a very famous narration of Hudayfa radiallahu an when Hudayfa said that the people they used to ask the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam about good, about the good things, how do we achieve paradise and how do we you know, how do we be better Muslims and how do we get reward and how do we, you know, so on and so forth. And I used to ask him about the evil out of a fear of falling into it or in order to avoid it. So this is what we are here to talk about today. We're not here to talk about the good in the sense of our achieving paradise or the good deeds that we do or, you know, some, something about the good. We're here to talk about the evil in order not to fall into it, to talk about the traps of the shaitan. And I thought we would begin, inshallah ta'ala, by asking the question, who is the shaitan? Who is this shaitan that we are trying to avoid? The scholars of the Arabic language, they had a lot of discussion and, and uh, disagreement over the word shaitan, where it originally comes from. But let's come up with a summary. And we'll say in summary that the word shaitan, it has the meaning of being far away far away from guidance, far away from the truth. The furthest of the people away from the truth. And it has the meaning of transgressing all bounds and going over all limits. So the shayateen or the shaitan from mankind and from the jinn are those human beings and those of the jinn who are the furthest away from the guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who have transgressed all bounds, who have crossed all of the limits, and who have reached the highest level of disbelief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These people who are so far away from the guidance of Allah azza wa jal, these people from mankind and from the jinn, we refer to them as being shayateen, or as being shaitan, i.e. being far away from the straight path. And as we mentioned just a few moments ago, and this is very important for us to understand, that the shayateen are both human and from the jinn. And we should not understand from the word shaitan that it only refers to the jinn that seek to misguide mankind or the jinn that seek to take the people away from the path of Allah Azza wa Jal. Because Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala mentions in an ayah of the Quran, shayateen al-insi wal-jinn. Shayateen from mankind and from the jinn. And the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam advised one of the companions seek refuge with Allah from the shaitan that is from the jinn and the shaitan that is from the men. And the companion said, O Messenger of Allah, 
Is it true that there is such a thing as a shaitan from the men? And the Prophet ﷺ affirmed this to him. And he confirmed for him that there are shayateen from the men. So this shaitan that we're going to talk about, his traps today, and we're going to talk about some of the ways that the shaitan seeks to misguide Bani Adam, that we are talking about those jinn and those human beings that have gone beyond all limits, that have gone beyond the, the more, to, the, to the, the most deepest and the most evil form of disbelief They seek to misguide people away from the path of Allah And they are the furthest of people away from the guidance of Allah Azza wa Jal And of course the leader of them And the imam of all of these shayateen Is Iblis la'anahullah And Iblis, we know the story of Iblis Iblis who was given the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he was the companion of the angels, that he spent his time along with the angels in the worship of Allah Azza wa Jal, that he was given all of the blessings of living in the paradise and all of the things that he was given. And then what did he do? He was asked to bow towards Adam and he refused. He refused to do so. He refused to do so because he had so much pride and so much sort of uh, taking, being, being, being boastful and being, being full of pride in himself that he said, I am better than him. He said, Ana khayrun min. I'm better than him. Khalaqtani min narim wa khalaqtahu min teen. You created him from, you created me from fire and you created him from teen, from, from clay, from dust mixed with water. So the pride of Iblis that took him away from the path of Allah Azza wa Jal. And when it took him away from the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he made the promise that he made to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He said, by the fact that you have misguided me, I'm going to sit for them on your straight path. I'm going to wait for them on your straight path. Then I'm going to come at them from every direction. He's going to come from the front and from behind and from the right and from the left. And you won't find most of them to be grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this Iblis who is the imam of the shayateen and who is the one that they take as an example and the one they take as a, a role model to follow, he is the one who refused to bow to Adam alayhi salam and he is the one who was thrown by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala out of paradise and he was given respite on the earth for a limited time for a wisdom that is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah at the beginning of his book Zadul Ma'ad he mentions a number of benefits and wisdom and some of the wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in allowing Iblis this time and this respite to misguide mankind because by the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allowed Iblis this opportunity, by this we see the difference between good and evil, and by this we see the difference between those people who are the awliya of Allah, who are the beloved of Allah, and those people who are the wretched. By this we see the test and the trial that exists in this earth that gives us an opportunity to achieve paradise and so on and so forth. And Ibn al-Qayyim, he mentions many of the wisdom in the misguidance of Iblis and in Iblis leaving paradise and in Iblis misguiding Adam alayhi salam and in this there is a great wisdom from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when we come on to talk about these traps of the shaitan, we should not think, we should not think for a second that these traps of the shaitan, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is unaware of them. Allah azza wa is not unaware of anything. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows all of these traps of the shaitan and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has allowed them to happen for a wisdom that is with him subhanahu wa ta'ala. We may appreciate some of that wisdom and we may not appreciate all of that wisdom because that wisdom it lies with Allah azza wa jal. So there is a wisdom in these traps of the shaitan. There is an opportunity for you to come closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by striving to fight against the shaitan and to fight against your own self. And fighting against the shaitan is one of the forms of striving and fighting in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That you fight against the shaitan and you fight against his traps and you fight against his plots. 
So there is a wisdom and there is a purpose behind the misguidance of Iblis. There is a purpose behind the traps of the shaitan that we experience every single day and that we are told and commanded to avoid. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the traps of the shaitan in the Quran and Allah Azza wa Jal says, Inna kayda shaytani kana da'ifa. The plot of the shaitan is constantly and forever weak. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't say, Inna kayda shaytani da'ifun. He didn't say that the plot of the shaitan is only just weak. He said, Inna kayda shaytani kana da'ifa. The plot of the shaitan is always and forever weak. It always has been weak and it always will be weak. There is no plot of the shaitan that will ever, ever, ever be strong. And that is for two main reasons that I want to present to you. The first reason why the plot of the shaitan will never, ever, ever be, be described as strong and is always being described as weak is because in response to that plot, there is another plot. As Allah Azza wa Jal mentions, إِنَّهُمْ يَكِيدُونَ كَيْدًا وَأَكِيدُ كَيْدًا They plot a plot and I plot a plot. And Allah Azza wa Jal says, وَمَكَرُوا وَمَكَرَ اللَّهُ And they plotted and Allah plotted, وَاللَّهُ خَيْرٌ مَاكِرِينَ And Allah is the best of those who plot. And the plotting of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it is plotting in response to the plotting of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's enemies. So whenever the enemies of Allah make a plot and make a plan, Allah's plan overcomes their plan. Whenever they make a method to misguide somebody, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes a method for them to get out of that misguidance. There is no plot of the shaitan except that Allah has a better plot and a better plan to respond to it. And this is the first reason why the plot of the shaitan will always be weak and the traps of the shaitan will always be weak. Because the traps of the shaitan, in response to them, there is the plot of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the plan of Allah azza wa jal. And there is nothing wrong with us affirming that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala plots and plans. But we don't affirm that Allah plots and plans in a general sense. But we say that Allah plots and plans in response to the plans of his enemies. And this is perfection from Allah azza wa jal. This is how we approach all of the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that have multiple meanings. So the attributes of Allah azza wa jal that have a good meaning and a bad meaning. We take away the bad meaning for the, from the right of Allah azza wa jal and we affirm the good meaning. So we say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we don't describe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as plotting and planning in a general sense, but we say that Allah plots against the plots of his enemies and every time his enemies make a plot, he has a plot which overcomes their plot and this is the perfection of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and this is the aqeedah of Ahl sunnah wal jama'ah with regard to affirming the plotting of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in response to the plots of his enemies subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is the first reason. The second reason why the plot of the shaitan is always weak is because the traps of the shaitan, they have no substance. What do I mean by this? They have no substance, they have nothing to them. Allah Azza wa Jal tells us about this in the Quran. وَقَالَ الشَّيْطَانُ لَمَّا قُضِيَ الْأَمْرِ The shaitan said when everything has finished, all of the judging has taken place and you know when it is being clear who is upon guidance and who is upon misguidance. وَقَالَ الشَّيْطَانُ لَمَّا قُضِيَ الْأَمْرُ إِنَّ اللَّهَ وَعَدَكُمْ وَعْدَ الْحَقِّ وَوَعَدْتُكُمْ فَأَخْلَفْتُكُمْ Allah has promised you the promise of truth. And I promised you and I broke my promise. And the, then the, the most important thing, the point that I'm going to make here, وَمَا كَانَ لِعَلَيْكُمْ مِنْ سُلْطَانِ I had no authority over you. I didn't have any authority over you. I didn't have anything, any control over you or any power over you. Except what? Except that I called you, فَاسْتَجَبْتُمْنِي I called you and I invited you and you answered me. So the reality of the traps of the shaitan is that the traps of the shaitan are just an invitation. The traps of the shaitan are nothing of substance. They are not traps that will physically grab you and tie you and you can't get out of them. All the shaitan can do is to invite you to the party. It's up to you if you accept the invitation or not. This is the meaning of the ayah. 
The shaitan says, I had no authority over you. I didn't have the ability to guide you. I didn't have the ability to misguide you. I didn't have the ability to force you into misguidance. I didn't have the ability to take you away from the path of Allah. All I could do is to call you and to invite you. Come on, disobey Allah. Disobey Allah. Come with me and disobey Allah. You'll enjoy it if you disobey Allah. It's just a call. It's just an invitation. And it's your choice whether you accept that invitation or whether you reject that invitation. So this is two of the reasons why the traps of the shaitan are weak. First of all, every plot the shaitan makes, Allah makes a plot which counters it. Second of all, the traps of the shaitan, they don't have any weight to them. They don't have any power to them. They don't have any sultan, any authority, any power, any weight. All they are is just an invitation to disobey Allah. The shaitan says, come to the party, come to the party, you'll have a great time. And it's up to you whether you say, yes, I'm going to come, or no, I'm not going to come. And that's why at the end of the day, the plot of the shaitan is forever weak. Let's take a moment to look at the general aims of the shaitan. What does the shaitan aim to do in a very general sense? These traps, they are not just random. These traps, they have a purpose and they have a plan. The shaitan, he has some outcomes. And with these outcomes, he aims to achieve the best outcome for him if he can. And if he can't achieve the best outcome, he's willing to accept a little bit lower and a little bit lower and a little bit lower and so on. So the shaitan, he has a set of outcomes, a set of goals that he wants to achieve. The first goal... And the goal that he wants you to achieve before everything and anything else is for all of us to disbelieve in Allah Azza wa Jal. This is the ultimate goal of the shaitan. Why? Because he is full of spite and jealousy and envy. He can't accept the fact that you submitted to Allah. Why should you submit to Allah when he didn't submit to Allah? He has that jealousy and that pride and that takabbur inside of himself. So he says, why should these people be guided? Why should anybody have paradise when I'm going to the hellfire? I want all of them to come with me out of spite and out of jealousy and out of envy. May Allah curse him. This is what he wants to do. This is what the shaitan he wants to do. So the first trap of the shaitan and the first aim and the first goal of the shaitan is to get you to disbelieve. And of course, once you disbelieve, don't think that the shaitan will be your friend. Don't think that he will support you once you have disbelieved in Allah Azza wa Jal. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, like the example of the man when the shaitan says to him, disbelieve. And when he disbelieves, the shaitan says, I am free of what you do. Subhanallah. The shaitan says, disbelieve. And when you disbelieve, he says, I've got nothing to do with it. This is the plot of the shaitan. It is just a call, but the first goal and the first aim of the shaitan and the outcome that he wants to achieve above and beyond everything else is that he wants you to disbelieve in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And ideally, he wants that to happen by you making a partner with Allah, by calling you to make a partner with Allah, by calling you to give some of the rights of Allah to something or somebody else. But the shaitan, he knows that he is cursed. He knows that the curse of Allah is upon him. And he knows that because the curse of Allah is upon him, he is not going to be successful. So he says, if I can't get them to disbelieve, fair enough, I'll take the next one down. I'll take bid'ah. Why is bid'ah the next aim from the shaitan if he can't get the 100%, if he can't get 10 out of 10 and get you to leave the religion of Islam? Why bid'ah? Why bid'ah above anything and everything else? Why does he want you to get to do innovation? Because the shaitan knows how merciful Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. He knows how merciful Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. And if you want an example of this, look at the example of Fir'aun. When Fir'aun was on his deathbed drowning, what happened? Jibreel came and Jibreel was stuffing mud from the seabed into the mouth of Fir'aun out of a fear that Fir'aun would say La ilaha illallah and Allah would forgive him. Jibreel even feared that Allah Azza wa Jal would forgive Fir'aun. And for this reason Jibreel stuffed mud into his mouth so that he wouldn't say La ilaha illallah out of a fear that Allah from his infinite mercy would forgive even Fir'aun. So the shaitan knows how forgiving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. 
And the shaitan wants you to do a sin that you will never, ever, ever ask forgiveness for. And if you look at bid'ah, the danger in innovation, the danger in bid'ah is what? The danger in bid'ah is that you think you are doing a really good thing and so you're never going to say, oh Allah, forgive me. Do you ever see a person fast in Ramadan and he doesn't follow the sunnah of the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he says, oh Allah, forgive me for fasting in Ramadan. Never. Oh Allah, forgive me for my hajj. Oh Allah, forgive me for my prayer. Oh Allah, forgive me for my dhikr. Oh Allah, forgive me for my, you know, my good deeds. People don't say this because bid'ah, it makes you think that what you are doing is good. You think that you're praying and you're fasting and you're performing the hajj and you're doing your dhikr and you're doing your dua and you're getting as close as possible to Allah and in reality Allah is destroying all of your deeds. So the shaitan, if he can't get you to commit shirk with Allah, if he can't get you to disbelieve, then he's happy for you to do innovations because at least he knows that you're not going to ask Allah to forgive you for those things. And this is why innovation is so dangerous because it's a major sin, but it's a sin that very few people ask forgiveness for because you don't realize it when you're doing it. But the shaitan, he knows that he is cursed and he knows that Allah Azza wa Jal has not written success for him in what he does. And so he is even content to accept less than that. He says, okay, there are some people, I can't get them to disbelieve in Allah. I can't get them to commit shirk, to make a partner with Allah. I will accept, I can't get them to commit bid'ah. I will accept the next level down. I will accept for them to do the major sins. I will accept for them to do the major sins. So he encourages you to do the major sins. So for example, drinking alcohol and fornication and being bad to your parents and you know, uh, not praying and all of these. He wants you to do the major sins because he knows that these sins seal up the heart. Black spots and black dots appear on the heart and they seal the heart and he knows the major sins are only forgiven by tawbah. Meaning that you have to ask Allah to forgive you for those major sins to be forgiven. You can't be forgiven for a major sin just by praying or just by going to hajj or performing umrah. You have to actually ask Allah to forgive you. So he says, well, maybe I have a better chance with this because inshallah, these people, they're not going to actually say, oh Allah, forgive me. Maybe I have a, a chance that some of them will die when they are doing these things. Maybe some of them, their hearts will be sealed. Maybe from the major sins, they will go into shirk and maybe they will leave Islam. So he still has some, you know, uh, some sort of aim in getting people to do the major sins. But he even knows that even the major sins, he won't be able to get everyone to do. So there are some people, he can't get them to commit shirk, and he can't get them to commit bid'ah, and he can't get them to commit the major sins. He doesn't even stop there. He says, I'm even willing for just to get them to commit frequent minor sins. Why? Because it's like the example the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam gave. The example of the minor sins is like the example of a person who he has tiny, tiny pieces of twigs, tiny little bits of, of kindling, you know, nothing major, not big sticks, just tiny, tiny little twigs. And he throws one of them on the fire and then another one on the fire and then another one on the fire and then another one. Eventually he will end up with a burning blaze. So the shaitan thinks maybe I can get him to do so many minor sins that they will build up and destroy a person. Or he will do them so frequently that they will become major in the sight of Allah because the minor sins that you do frequently without caring about them, they become major sins in the sight of Allah Azza wa Jal. So he will try to get you to do the minor sins as many of them as possible. But the shaitan, he even knows that even the minor sins, he can't get the people to do them all the time. So he even has a plan after the minor sins. And that is to get people to busy themselves with things that have no reward. Go shopping, go play computer games, go and talk to your friends, go out, go play pool, go play football, do anything but don't do something you're going to get rewarded from in the sight of Allah. Look at how much evil, look at how corrupt this heart is. The heart of this Iblis and the heart of these shayateen that even if they know you're going to go to Jannah they still want you to get the lowest place in Jannah possible even when he knows you're going to Jannah he says no major sins no, he's got no minor sins he's constantly asking forgiveness from Allah but still I would rather he didn't get a high place in Jannah so what I'm going to do is I'm going to get him to busy himself all the time with things that have no reward in the sight of Allah 
work. You need the money. Without the money, you won't be able to do anything. Don't study. You don't have time. Don't learn Islam. Don't go to the masjid. You don't have time. You need to work. You need to do this. You need to do that. Oh, don't read the book today. Don't read the Quran today. Let's go out. Let's play. Anything to get you to do the things which are of no reward instead of the things which are of reward. But even then, the shaitan knows that there is a group of the people and there are some of us from time to time in our lives where even this doesn't work. And the shaitan still has a plan for them. He still doesn't give up. He still has a plan for them. And his plan for them is to get them to do those things that have less reward instead of those things which have more reward. So they have an opportunity to do something that has a lot of reward. Let's say the night prayer, Qiyam al-Layl. And so the shaitan will encourage them to sleep in for Qiyam al-Layl in order for them to do a deed which has less reward. So the shaitan, for example, will encourage them to, I don't know, to do something small uh, which takes up their time, something which has less reward, which takes up their time late at night so that they don't pray Qiyam al-Layl. So he tries to get you some to do something that has less reward instead of something that has more reward. And the key thing about these general aims of the shaitan is we should not understand that each of these has unique groups of people. No, each of these can apply to all of us in our lives. There, our iman goes up and down. There are times in our day, in our lives, where we want to do a good deed. At that time we want to do a good deed, the shaitan is going to try to get you to do the least good deed possible. There are times when you want to do major sins, so the shaitan is going to try to encourage you to do those. And he's going to try to get you always to move up a level. So if he's got you doing uh, minor sins, he's going to try to make the major sins, let's get him a step up, major sins. Okay, major sins, let's try and get him maybe to enter into, you know, some kind of bid'ah or something that might lead him to disbelief. And he's going to constantly work to push you up. The shaitan is tireless in this aim. Because he knows where he is going. He knows about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he knows his final destination is the hellfire. And so he values his time on this earth. Perhaps we don't value our time on this earth. But the shaitan, he values his time on this earth. Because he knows his final destination is the hellfire. So he wants to make the maximum use of this time to misguide as many people as possible. And then we have to understand that the shaitan, he aims for, uh, to get you stage by stage and to take his time to misguide you. The shaitan isn't b b bothered if it takes 10 years to misguide a person or a lifetime to misguide a person. He's aiming for the final destination. So look at how the shaitan misguided the people of Nuh over how many generations. He didn't begin by introducing idol worship 10 generations after Adam. He began very, very, very simply with very small things, encouraging people to praise the pious people who passed away, encouraging people to exaggerate a little bit about the pious people who passed away, and then moving on from that to making pictures just to remember them, not to worship them, just to remember them. So don't worship the pictures, that would be haram. Just make pictures so you remember the pious people. And then... You know, these pictures, they aren't enough for you to remember them by. You should make statues so that you can remember them. But don't worship the statues. Whatever you do, that would be haram. Don't worship the statues. Just make the statues so that you can remember and so that you can emulate these pious people who are beloved to Allah. And then, generation after generation, we found your fathers worshipping these statues. And then the shaitan introduced shirk into this ummah. Subhanallah. Into this nation, into, into Bani Adam. Look at the time frame. He begins with just simply pictures to remember the pious people. Or maybe a little bit of exaggeration regarding the pious people. A little bit of an excess in love for the pious people. Then pictures, then statues, then worship. Over generations of time. So the shaitan is very, very, very patient. And you have to be more patient than the shaitan. What about specific plots of the shaitan? Things that the shaitan is mentioned about the shaitan in the Qur'an that he will do very specifically. Let's just look at what the Qur'an says. The Qur'an talks about the shaitan promising you poverty, making you fear poverty, and commanding you to do immorality. The shaitan makes you fear poverty. So the shaitan is all about connecting you to this world. One of the traps of the shaitan is connecting you to this world. 
too much and making you fear that, that you're not going to be successful in this world and making you fear that you're not going to achieve anything in this world. That you need to go and get yourself this education, even if that education compromises your deen in Islam. You need to go and get yourself this job, even if the job isn't halal. You need to go and do this action, even though the action is going to lead you to the anger of Allah Azza wa Jal. The shaitan is going to try to get you too connected to this dunya. And you have to remember that when we talk about Muslims abstaining from the dunya and keeping away from the dunya, the meaning of this abstaining from the dunya and keeping away from the dunya is not that you don't have any wealth and you live in poverty. Islam doesn't ask us to live in poverty. And Islam doesn't ask us to, you know, completely, you know, lock ourselves up in monasteries like the Christian monks did. But Islam asks you not to have your heart attached to the wealth that you have. Not to have your heart attached to this dunya. So if it comes, it comes. If it goes, it goes. But it's not your primary aim. It's not what you care about. It's not what you spend all of your day and night doing. Take yourself and keep yourself a little diary. Just what you did during the day. Subhanallah, most of us will spend a third to a half of our time asleep and a quarter of our time, whatever, doing whatever it may be, working or seeking something from the dunya. And then maybe an eighth of that time will be eating and drinking. And you're left with the tiniest amount of your time which is actually spent towards the worship of Allah Azza wa Jal because the shaitan focuses you completely upon the dunya. If somebody came to you and told you that you were going to die tonight, you wouldn't care about your job, you wouldn't care about this world, you wouldn't care about what you've earned or what you haven't earned, you would only care about the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And of course, like the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, there's a time for this and there's a time for that. We're not asking you not to go to work, we're not asking you to cut yourself off from the dunya, we're not asking you not to have a good time, but make sure that a big portion of your time is dedicated towards what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created you for. And of course in this we've mentioned before the concept of ihtisab, of getting a good deed out of your dunya based actions. How do you get a good deed out of the actions you do which are purely for the dunya? By remembering that your intention in it is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you go to work and you say, oh Allah I'm going to work. But my intention for going to work is so that I can earn money and give zakah, so that I can earn money and feed my family, so that I don't have to take haram loans, so that I don't have to betray the principles of my religion. And that intention that you have when you go to work, you are rewarded for. You know, let's say, for example, there is somebody there cleaning the house. Even when they're cleaning the house, they're saying that, for example, there's a lady, she's cleaning the house, she's saying, oh Allah, I'm doing this. Because you told me to obey my husband and you told me to take care of my husband's house. So this is part of me fulfilling the duties that you gave. And inshallah, she's rewarded for that work that she does in the house, even if it is something that is purely from the dunya. So the shaitan, one of the aims, the shaitan, uh, he, he makes you fear, he promises you poverty and he makes you fear poverty. He makes you fear that, you know, don't do this. You know, you can't possibly earn a halal living. You can't give up the alcohol that you sell in your newsagent. You can't give up the alcohol that you sell in your restaurant because you won't earn any money. This is the shaitan and one of the traps of the shaitan that he is promising you poverty. If you think about this argument, this picture that we're drawing, you have a brother, he has a restaurant and he knows he's selling most of his money he's earning from alcohol. So the shaitan, he comes and he tells him, you're never going to be rich unless you sell this alcohol. And he doesn't think that Allah is ar-razaq. Allah, if he wants to, can shower him with wealth from the heavens and the earth. More than that, he doesn't think that he's going to be asked about that wealth on the day of judgment. He doesn't think that Allah sucks out all of the barakah in his wealth because of the alcohol that he sells. And so on and so forth. So the shaitan, he dresses things up. It's just a call. He doesn't force the man to sell alcohol, but he just convinces him that if he doesn't sell alcohol in his shop, he's never, ever, ever going to make any money. What do we say to the brother? We say to him that realize that the provision is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that if Allah blesses you in your wealth, even a tiny bit would be enough for you. Don't, don't say that Allah can't give me wealth. Don't say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can't bless me enough that I can have barakah in my wealth from the halal. And so the brother needs to make a plan to remove alcohol from the restaurant, to look to you know, uh, replace it with something different. So he might, for example, 
uh, decide to start selling lots of different kinds of non-alcoholic cocktails, lots of different kinds of juices, lots of different kinds of drinks to make up for the fact that he doesn't sell alcohol. Maybe he starts advertising alcohol-free restaurant, family-friendly, and he starts to make a plan. And with this plan, he escapes from the trap of the shaitan, trusting in Ar-Rahman, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The shaitan commands you with al-fahsha. The shaitan, like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Quran, يَأْمُرُكُمْ بِالْفَحْشَاء And al-fahsha are all of the immoralities, things like zina, like pornography, like uh, you know, illicit relationships, like mixing, free mixing with women, like talk, men and women talking to each other in an inappropriate way. All of these things are what we call fahsha, immoralities, things that are immoral, that lead to zina and that lead to the breakdown of the society. The shaitan loves for you to do this. So this is another thing and this is specifically and especially with the young people. The shaitan plays on their emotions. He plays on the fact that they have you know, needs and desires and that their hormones are raging and he makes even sometimes the shaitan will use this from an, a religious point of view. And you'll ask the brother, Ya Akhi, what are you doing mixing with all those women? And he'll say, I'm just giving them da'wah. I'm a da'i, I'm, I'm in my university and I'm calling those girls to Islam. They're not practicing and I'm helping them to practice Islam. And this is from the greatest of the traps of the shaitan for the young people. That he convinces you that this wrongdoing that you're doing is for the sake of Allah. So he says that, yeah, yeah, you know, you know, go and talk to that girl. You know, it's not, you know, it's nothing. Or he'll say, have a relationship with that girl because you're going to marry her in the end, right? You know, he'll say, inshallah, you know, you've got a niya. Your niya is that you're going to marry her. So it doesn't matter. You know, get a bit closer because the shaitan is always trying to encourage you. So shaitan, one of his major aims that is mentioned more than once in the Quran is al-fahsha. Because he knows this breaks down the society, it breaks down the individual, it leads you away from the path of Allah, and eventually it gets you into more and more major sins, and it may even lead to a person turning away from Islam. How many young people have turned away from Islam because they fell in love with a girl? Or how many young ladies have run away from home and have left their parents and eventually you know, left their hijab and left their practicing of Islam because of a guy? So the shaitan is not stupid. He knows the effect of al-fahsha, of immorality on the society. And he knows that this immorality, it leads to further things. It leads to people going away from Islam. So he wants to encourage it as much as possible. Because this immorality, it stops you from practicing Islam. How many people do you know who have a boyfriend or a girlfriend and pray five times a day? Very, very few. I'm not saying it doesn't exist, but very few. For the simple reason that prayer forbids you from al-fahsha and the shaitan commands you to do it. So the more that you pray and the more that you spend time in the masjid, even those people who have a boyfriend or a girlfriend, they're going to move away from it naturally because the salah, the prayer is going to stop them from doing it. Subhanallah. And if there is anyone who watches the video, who is listening, who is in this kind of situation, I say to you simply one thing straight. Either you're not praying or either your prayer is not being performed properly. Because if you are preparing or, pr or performing your prayer properly five times a day, your prayer would protect you from these things. So I say to these people and an advice to myself and others, look at your prayer. If you find yourself falling into immorality, if you find yourself you have a problem with, uh, with uh, men and women or you have a problem with, for example, pornography or you have a problem with something like this, then look at your prayer. Because for sure there is a problem somewhere in your prayer. Either it's not being done on time, it's not being done in the masjid, it's not being done with khushur, or it's not being done at all. Because the prayer, it forbids you from doing these things. And that is the way we escape from the trap of the shaitan when it comes to al-fahsha. And in another ayah, Allah Azza wa Jal mentions, إِنَّمَا يَأْمُرُكُمْ بِالسُّوء He commands you everything which is evil. And again, and he commands you to do immorality. And this is one of the greatest aims of the shaitan, that you say about Allah that which you have no knowledge about. That you say something about Allah and you don't know whether that thing is true or not. How many times do we make statements just not even thinking about it? Why is this happening to me? Life's not fair. All of these things are saying about Allah that which you have no knowledge about. You know, oh, Allah doesn't love me. Allah isn't going to answer my dua. We're too low to be answered by Allah. This is all from the forms of saying about Allah that which you do not know. 
And this is from the worst of the sins that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Quran. So the shaitan, he wants to encourage you to make statements about Allah and statements about Islam that you don't know. He wants to encourage you to be a bit quick to give a fatwa, a bit quick to give a decision. And this is another thing with the young lads. You get a young brother, he's practicing Islam, alhamdulillah, he's praying in the masjid, the shaitan comes to him and he encourages him to maybe be a bit quick in giving an opinion. To maybe give an opinion a little bit too quickly and then to fall into saying about Allah or to saying about the religion of Allah what he doesn't know. So he says, brother, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. How many times are we in the masjid we hear this? So you're having a conversation with a brother and you're saying, Ya Akhi, you know, subhanAllah, you really must grow your beard. You shouldn't, you honestly, you shouldn't shave your beard. It's, it's haram for you to shave your beard. And a brother pops in, pops his head in between the two and says, Ya Akhi, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. This is exactly what we mean. That you say about Allah that which you do not know. You just invented something in the religion of Islam that you had no idea whether it was halal or haram, but you offered your opinion anyway. This is from the traps of the shaitan and from the ways that the shaitan gets to the practicing people because don't think that the shaitan leaves the practicing people alone one of the methods the shaitan uses to get to the practicing people is to encourage you to speak a bit too quickly to give a judgment before you understand you know you hear two brothers arguing about an islamic point is this wajib is it sunnah you come in and you say well i think as soon as your sentence starts i think stop there because i think this is not how we make rulings in islam we make rulings in Islam with qala Allah wa qala Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allah said and his messenger said sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So if you don't have something from Allah said or his messenger said sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, don't offer your opinion. That's as simple as that because this is from the traps of the shaitan that the shaitan wants to get you eventually to start saying things about Allah and about the religion of Allah azza wa jal that you don't know. From the ayat which talk about the plots of the shaitan and the traps of the shaitan is the statement of Allah Azza wa Jal reporting or relaying what the shaitan says, verily I will mislead them and surely I will arouse within them their desires. And desires, these are not just the desires for, for, for sort of relationships between men and women, but even desires for wealth, for status, desires to be, you know, to have power, desires to sort of, you know, follow that which makes your soul content, even if it doesn't isn't good for you in the religion and certainly I will order them to slit the ears of cattle and I will order them to change the creation of Allah to change the means by which Allah has created you to make you ungrateful for what Allah has given you so you see somebody and they say you know I want to just you know have something done to my nose or I want to have something done uh, to make me look a little bit different or I want to have some sort of cosmetic surgery or the girls that get hair extensions or eyelash extensions or subhanAllah, the boys these days, Allahu musta'an. But you know, these kinds of things, the changing of the creation of Allah Azza wa Jal, that he makes you feel ungrateful towards Allah, that what Allah has given me, it's not good enough. Allah hasn't created me in a way that's good enough. And again, this is just trying to encourage you to copy the shaitan how he is, you should be. So how he wasn't grateful for what Allah gave him, he wants to make you ungrateful for what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, has given you. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and whoever takes shaitan as his wali, as his protector, as his, uh, the one who he relies on for support, instead of Allah has surely suffered a manifest loss. The shaitan makes promises to them and he arouses their desires and shaitan's promises are nothing but deception. So from this again, we see that the promises of the shaitan, the, 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 the dawah of the shaitan is only deception. From the plots of the shaitan and the traps of the shaitan that are mentioned in the Quran is the use of sihr and seeking help from the jinn, black magic and seeking help from the jinn. And this is a topic for another day, but just briefly, very, very briefly to discuss uh, from the, the, the means that the, the shaitan uses to entrap people is to get them to seek help from the jinn in order to harm someone or in order to benefit someone. And this help from the jinn, it increases them only in loss. And it makes them, increases them only in weakness. It just makes them weak and it makes them lose. <coughs> so this is one of the means that the shaitan uses to trap the people. And this is from different means. So some people, if the shaitan knows they are extremely weak, he will get them to practice sihr. 
to actually they themselves seek help from the jinn. But even if the person doesn't seek help from the jinn or the shaitan can't get them themselves, he will encourage them to go to somebody who seeks help from the jinn. Which is very common in our communities That somebody goes to a healer Or goes to a magician Or goes to a woman who knows where People's things who they, where they, where they get, When they get lost She knows where they are And they go to them and they say Oh we need, you know we have a problem Our daughter can't get married And we need your help And the person says no problem Give me some of her clothes Give me some of her hair And he puts them together And he says yes you know something has been done to you I will send you some jinn that will protect you And so on and so forth this is from the major traps of the shaitan that are mentioned in the Quran. And alhamdulillah, as Muslims, we put our trust in Allah. When we have problems and when we have difficulties, we turn back to Allah Azza wa And we never, ever, ever, no matter how bad our situation gets, no matter how much oppression other people do to us, even if we are suffering from black magic, we never dream of going to somebody who does this kind of thing Because we know that what they do Is simply seeking help from the shaitan And it is from the greatest forms of disbelief And the greatest forms of evil So when we look at all of these Plots of the shaitan in the Quran When we look at all of these plots Of the shaitan in the Quran We find that they go back to two things And these two things Are mentioned in Surah Al-Fatiha at the very end of Surah Al-Fatiha, we say to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, اِهْدِنَ الصِّرَاطَ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ Guide us to the straight path. And we know the straight path is the straight path of those who Allah has given His blessings upon from the Nabiyyin, from the Prophets, and from the Siddiqeen, the Truthful, and from the Shuhada, from the Martyrs, and from the Salihin, وَحَسُنَا أُولَٰئِكَ رَفِيقًا And how wonderful are that group of people as uh, a set of companions. And then we say, that we say, اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم The path of those upon you have, you have bestowed your favor upon From the prophets and the truthful and the martyrs and the pious غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين And we seek refuge from two groups of people المغضوب عليهم هو المغضوب عليهم المغضوب عليهم As the Messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم interpreted Are the Jews But why? What I want to go back to is fundamentally why are those Jews described as al maghdubi alayhim? They are those people who know the truth and yet they turn away from it. So anybody who knows the truth and turns away from it, they are from al maghdubi alayhim. And then al dalin and al dalin are those people who don't know the truth in the first place. And they are typified and exemplified by the Christians. Okay, so al maghdubi alayhim are the Jews and al-Dalin are the Christians. And the meaning of this are those people who know the truth and turn away from it and those people who don't know the truth at all. Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah commented on the ayah in which Allah Azza wa Jal talks about the mankind carrying the amana of Islam. وَحَمَلَهَا insan إِنَّهُ كَانَ ظَلُومًا jahula. And mankind took on this responsibility and mankind was constantly in a state of oppression and constantly in a state of ignorance. And Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah, he comments on this ayah and he says, the essence of every evil in this world are these two things, oppression and ignorance. Oppression and ignorance are the essence of every single form of evil in this world. Every evil, you will not find an evil from the evils of this world except that it comes under one of these two things. It is either a form of oppression or a form of ignorance. And this is why in our prayer we seek refuge from the oppressive people, i.e. those people who know the truth, but they still go ahead and do the wrong, so they're oppressive, and those people who don't know it and so they are ignorant. And like Ibn Taymiyyah said, all of the evil in the world comes from these two things. Oppression and ignorance. Oppression and ignorance. So if we look at the state of mankind, the state of mankind, if they don't embrace Islam, if they don't turn to Islam, if they don't correct their character by use of the, the means to correct it that are given to us in Islam, then what do they end up? They end up in a state of oppressing by when they know the truth and they don't do it, or a state of ignorance where they don't know the truth in the first place. And the shaitan, he builds upon these two things. And he builds upon them with two uh, key things. He builds upon them with shahawat and he builds upon them with shubuhat. 
So as for the issue of dhulm, of oppression, the shaitan builds upon this oppression by the means of shahawat, your desires. So the shaitan tries to get you to f follow your desires, to follow what your soul craves for. You know, you just, you know, at the end of the day, how many of you, you know, you find sort of, you find like your soul craves when you're lazy, you don't do anything, you don't want to go out and go to work, you just want to eat food and you just, you know, you have your desires from uh, relationships, men and women, and you have your desires from, you know, the food that you eat and you have desires from wealth and status and power. These kind of desires that can be at odds with Islam, that can be against Islam, the shaitan, he wants you to follow them, and this is the dhulm that the shaitan wants you to do to yourself, the oppression the shaitan wants you to do to yourself. And on the other side, on the side of ignorance, the shaitan, he has shubuhat. He spreads false ideas and false notions. He spreads misguidance amongst the people. Things that you hear it and you think that it's true, but it's not true. And the shaitan uses these to make you ignorant and to make you turn away from the path of Allah Azza wa Jal. So how do we combat these two things? Because all of the traps of the shaitan, they come down to these two things. Either they come down to desires and oppression, or they come down to ignorance and misguidance. That's all of the traps of the shaitan come down to these two things. So what do we use to combat each one? As for the issue of desires and self-oppression, we combat this by patience in obedience to Allah and patience in avoiding sin. So we do our best to prohibit our souls from following those things that they crave that are haram. And that's why Allah Azza wa Jal says, mentions, وَأَمَّا مَنْ خَافَ مَقَامَ رَبِّهِ وَنَهَا النَّفْسَ عَنِ الْهَوَى As for the one who fears what is going, he fears standing before his Lord. And he forbids his soul from its desires. He forbids its soul from the haram that it wants. The nature of your soul that Allah created you with is that it wants to incline itself towards evil. <inaudible> the soul is constantly inclining, moving itself towards evil. You have to rope it in and pull it back. One of the mashayikh, he once said to me, the soul of a man is like a camel. This is what he said to me. And I said, Sheikh, I have no idea what a camel is like, so you're going to have to explain this to me. So he said, look, it's this simple. The first time you ask a camel to sit for you, it takes all of your strength and you physically have to drag it down to the ground and hold it there. Once it's sat for you once, it'll sit for you anytime. And your soul is like this. So the first time you have to get your soul away from something that it craves, let's say you're addicted to a kind of a drug, or you're addicted to something haram, or you're in a haram relationship, and it's a kind of an addiction, your soul is finding some kind of peace and some kind of, your soul is finding some kind of happiness from it. The first time you pull yourself away from that, it's gonna be hard. It's gonna be like dragging the camel to the ground. It's very, very physically demanding, it's very hard. But once you've got your soul used to it, your soul will behave, just like the camel will behave. A Couple of times you have to drag it to the ground and then it'll behave itself. Your soul is the same. The f a few times you have to drag your soul to the ground and force it to obey you and then after that it will behave itself. So this is an example of how we combat desires and we combat self-oppression. How do we combat ignorance and misguided notions and false beliefs that are spread amongst the people? We combat these by getting knowledge in Islam. So we can summarize our method against the shaitan, against the traps of the shaitan, that we get knowledge and we act upon it and we call others to it, and we are patient as a result to, of what happens to us when we do so. We are patient in doing good deeds, and patient in keeping away from evil deeds, and patient upon what befalls us from the qadr and the qada of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when we do that. So this is our basic methodology against the traps of the shaitan. So whatever the shaitan is going to do to you, it's going to be from one of these two things. Either he's going to get your desires going and your soul going and your soul moving off, or he's going to get your knowledge confused and to try and misguide you and take you away from the path of Allah Azza wa Jal. So you're going to combat that by learning Islam. You're going to combat that by practicing what you know. You're going to combat that by calling other people to what you practice. And you're going to combat that by being patient upon doing good deeds, being patient upon keeping away from sins, and being patient upon the qadr and the qada of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you're going to do this, all of this, seeking help with the remembrance of Allah. 
Because Allah Azza wa Jal mentions that the one who doesn't remember Allah is going to be afflicted by the traps of the shaitan. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَنْ يَعِشُ عَنْ ذِكْرِ الرَّحْمَانِ نُقَيِّضْ لَهُ شَيْطَانًا فَهُوَ لَهُ قَرِينٌ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, whoever turns himself away from the remembrance of Allah, he stops doing the dhikr of Allah, we will appoint for him a shaitan, and that shaitan will be an intimate companion for him. So when you turn away from the remembrance of Allah, you get afflicted by the traps of the shaitan. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions on the other side the description of the believers. Indeed, those people who have taqwa, those people who fear Allah, when an evil thought comes to them from the shaitan, when one of the traps of the shaitan comes to them, they remember Allah and then they can see clearly. So through the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we can push the traps of the shaitan away from us. So we can mention the adhkar that keep us away from the traps of the shaitan. We can mention, for example, there are many adhkar, for example, أعوذ بكلمات الله التامات التي لا يجاوزهن بر ولا فاجر من شر ما خلق وبرأ وذرأ ومن شر ما ينزل من السماء ومن شر ما يعرج فيها ومن شر ما ذرأ في الأرض ومن شر ما... ومن شر ما ينزل من السماء ومن شر ما يخرج من شر ما ينزل من السماء ومن شر ما يعرج فيها ومن شر ما ذرأ في الأرض ومن شر ما يخرج منها ومن شر كل طارق إلا طارق يترق بخير يا رحمن. This ذكر from the adhkar is said that it foils the traps of the shaitan. That if you say it, it pushes away the traps of the shaitan. So this is again, you can learn your adhkar, the ذكر that you make in the morning and the ذكر that you make in the evening. The remembrance that you make in the morning and the remembrance you make in the evening after Fajr and after Maghrib keeps you away from the traps of the shaitan. The traps of the shaitan, ya ikhwan, they can be very subtle. From the traps of the shaitan, for example, that are very subtle is the student of knowledge. The, the person who is a studying Islam and practicing Islam, the shaitan tries to get them to study a lot and not to do too much worship. So the shaitan will say to them, you know, you don't, you don't want to be in the masjid. Why are you sat in the masjid? You're wasting your time. You should be in the library reading books. You should be sat teaching people. Why are you doing worship? Why are you praying the night prayer? It means that you're not going to be able to go and teach the people the next day. And so on and so forth. So the shaitan's traps are very subtle. But when we use the dhikr of Allah and we remember Allah Azza wa Jal and we are patient upon our good deeds and patient in keeping away from our sins, insha'Allah ta'ala through this we will foil the enemy, the plots of our enemy, the shaitan. Finally, and this is also very, very, very important, is really to emphasize to all of you the importance of knowing how the shaitan affects you as an individual. We've given some very brief examples from the Qur'an and from the Sunnah about how the shaitan afflicts a person. But for you guys, every single one of you, and for me, there are unique ways that the shaitan afflicts you. Just think. Think about the sins that you do quite often. Think about the sins that maybe you know, yeah, I've got this sin. If I was to ask you to just put one sin in your head now, one thing that you know that you do quite frequently and you know that you haven't been very successful to stop it. If you think of this, you think that there's a way the shaitan encourages you to do it. For example, let's say that your thing is swearing, for example, bad language. And you know the shaitan gets you angry, you get angry with yourself, and when you get angry with yourself, you lose control. So that's your individual battle with the shaitan. That's one thing the shaitan does for you as an individual. So you need to know your own enemy's plots against you, and you need to think of a way to stop that for you yourself. So you need to think, right, what is it that actually makes me angry? Well, I get angry when I allow an argument with my wife to go too far. So what I'm going to do now is when an argument starts to build up, I'm going to simply say, Jazakillahu khayran, and I'm going to turn around and say, Salaamu alaikum, and I'm going to walk out. And this is going to stop me getting angry. It's going to stop my anger boiling over, and then it's going to stop me doing this thing that I'm doing. So this is one thing. You look at your own situation and you look at how the shaitan is getting to you as an individual and how the shaitan is trapping you as an individual. For example, if you know that you have a problem listening to music and you know that when you listen to music, it's because the shaitan makes you, you, you hang around with certain friends and they listen to music and then that gets you into music and you go home and listen to it yourself. You need to make a plan to stop the shaitan getting to you in that way 
by leaving that group of friends, for example, by throwing away your music tapes, by stopping yourself have access, having access to music on the phone or whatever it may be. You need to think about what it is the shaitan is using to get at you and then make a plan to get away from that. So yes, there are general things the shaitan is doing to everybody and then there are some specific traps the shaitan is doing just for you. And those specific traps the shaitan is doing just for you, you need to have a real serious think about it and to make a way out of it. Because at the end of the day, the shaitan is your enemy. Allah Azza wa describes the shaitan as your enemy. He's an enemy for you. So take him as an enemy. And Allah commands you to take the shaitan as an enemy. And if he's your enemy, that means he's constantly seeking a way to get at you. So the more that you think to cut off and the quicker you can cut off these things, the better it will be. So maybe you think that one of my problems is that I am, have been tried with a problem of mixing and, and sort of relationships with women. Think about when does this actually happen? Because for sure you're not exposed to non-mahram women every minute of every day. It must be, for example, the problem is work. The problem is university. The problem is when I go on the internet and I start chatting to people. Whatever the problem is, think how is the shaitan trapping me? How can I cut it off? Okay, what I'm going to do, I'm going to cut off this opportunity on the internet. I'm going to cancel my... I don't know, Facebook account or whatever I'm using to do this thing, I'm going to cancel that and I'm going to change my phone number and that is going to stop this particular trap of the shaitan. And then you don't rest on your laurels because you know that the shaitan is going to come up with something else. Once you've overcome him with one thing, like a dedicated enemy, he's not going to stop and just say, okay, that's enough now. I'm not going to do anything. I've had enough. Okay, he's won. No, he's going to say, okay, you won that battle. Now I'm going to try something different. You know you've cancelled, you've changed your phone number and you've cancelled your internet email accounts and so now I know that I'm not going to get at you with uh, the issue of talking between men and women so now I'm going to try and get at you with music. And then you find a way out of that and you say, right, now I'm going to try and get at you with this temptation. Now I'm going to try and get at you with this thing. Now I'm going to try and misguide you in your knowledge. Now I'm going to try to discourage you from doing good deeds and so on and so on and so forth. So this is a constant battle. It is a battle that will carry on until the day of judgment as the shaitan made dua to Allah when Iblis said, Oh Allah, oh my Lord, give me respite until the, until the day when they are resurrected. Let me live until the day of judgment. So until the day of judgment, these traps are going to be set up. And until the day of judgment, you have to be more clever than your enemy. Every time he has a trap, you have to have a better trap. And through the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, remembering Allah, seeking help from Allah, and doing those prescribed adhkar that keep you safe from the shaitan, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be with you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will support you and help you in overcoming the shaitan that has been put there to lay down these traps. And we can conclude by asking Allah azza wa jal to save us from the traps of the shaitan and to show us the truth as the truth and to allow us to follow it and to show us the falsehood as the falsehood and to allow us to keep away from it and not to mix those up so that we become misguided and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one that we turn to for help and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who is able to do all things. Inshallah, I think we have time for some questions, inshallah. Jazakallah, Sheikh. I've had quite a few uh, questions text through to me, so I'll, I'll deal with these questions first, if that's okay, and then take uh, questions from the floor. The first one is, can the shayateen physically force someone to disobey Allah? I think uh, the general principle, and we have to say in a general sense, is that nobody can force you to disobey Allah, except for the circumstance that we call ikrah where someone is physically forced to disobey Allah. Um, and this can come from the shayateen. For example, when the shaitan turns someone to insanity and he makes them go to a level where they're insane and, they, and then he sort of uh, you know, encourages them or forces them to disobey Allah. So yes, in the circumstance of ikrah, where someone is physically forced and, and their life is threatened and they are forced to disobey Allah, but this is a very rare situation. And the general rule is that the shaitan can't force you to disobey Allah Azza wa Jal. And the shaitan cannot be blamed for your disobedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. All of the shaitan's influence in the Quran is described as calling you. The shaitan called you to do this. He invited you to do this. 
He convinces you, he arouses desires in you, he calls you, but as for forcing you, there is nothing of this mentioned in the Quran, except in those very limited situations of ikrah, when someone is physically forced to disobey Allah, and this can happen, I suppose, in cases where someone is afflicted by something like black magic, or they are afflicted by jinn possession, and the jinn literally force them to the disobedience of Allah, but this is a very, very, very rare case, and of course, a person, when they are Mukrah, uh, when they are forced to do something, is not taken into account for what they do. So, in general, this is the exception to the rule. The general, the, the general rule is the shaitan cannot force you to disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and Allah knows best. How do you deal with the shaitan and his continuous whisperings? The whisperings of the shaitan, there's a general answer to this and a specific answer to this. The general answer to the whispering of the shaitan is that you get rid of it with the remembrance of Allah. As Allah Azza wa Jal mentions in the ayah, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ اتَّقَوْا إِذَا مَسَّهُمْ طَائِفٌ مِّنَ الشَّيْطَانِ تَذَكَّرُوا فَإِذَا هُمْ مُبْصِرُونَ Indeed, those people who fear Allah, when they are afflicted by an evil thought from the shaitan, they remember Allah and then they are able to see clearly. Now there may be some circumstances when this waswasa becomes uncontrollable and it becomes to the point where a person feels that the shaitan has a real control over them and this requires a little bit more effort. One of the best tactics is that we distinguish between those people who have a little bit of waswasa and those people who have very very bad waswasa. As for those people who have a little bit of waswasa, they simply remember Allah and then they are able to see clearly. As for those people who it becomes very severe, my advice to them is do not allow this to affect your ibadah. In other words, if the shaitan, you know the shaitan comes for you to you in every prayer and confuses you to the point where you repeat your prayer three, four times every prayer, then what is obligatory for you to do is to simply pray and don't repeat it. Just pray however you pray and don't repeat it until the waswasa becomes less. Likewise, the one who makes wudu three, four, five times every time they make wudu. Ha oh, I forgot. Oh, I forgot again. Oh, I forgot again. And so on and so forth. This person in this situation, we say to them, don't repeat your wudu. Just simply do it however you do it. And Allah will accept it from you. And don't, uh, you know, don't allow yourself to be, con uh, to be uh, convinced or to be misguided by the shaitan in this way. But that's for the one who it's very, very, very severe. As for the one who has light waswasa, let's say every now and again, once in a month, once in a, in a quarter, once every couple of weeks, he forgets in his wudu, this person begins from the beginning and repeats their wudu again. But when the waswasa becomes very, very, very severe, it's obligatory upon the person to simply ignore it completely and just carry on as they are. I'll give one more example because it is an important issue. And that's the example of people who get waswasa when they think that they are uh, becoming unclean. So they think that they are soiling their clothes. For example, they go to the bathroom, they come out and they say, Oh no, I must have dirtied my clothes. I will go in and they wash everything again. They make wudu again. They come out of the bathroom and they say, Oh no, I think I have. And they go back in. This person, it is obligatory on them. If there is no evidence for this, there's no medical reason why this should be happening, that they just ignore it completely and just pray as they are. And eventually the shaitan will, the waswasa will lessen and they will become like, uh, like uh, ordinary people who suffer from a small amount of of waswasa from the shaitan like we all do but it should not reach the level where someone is repeating every single prayer or missing every single prayer or repeating every single wudu and Allah knows best okay. since everyone has a personal shaitan what happens to him when you die? Allah Azza wa knows best this is something that I don't think that there is a that I know of I won't say that there isn't a dalil for it but I will say that I don't know of a dalil for what happens to the Qareen when you die. We know that the Qareen will eventually die. But does the Qareen die when you die or does the Qareen continue to live after you die? Allah Azza wa Jal knows best. Okay. Um, I've had two questions. I'll try to amalgamate them into one. What happens when you have pictures in your house? And secondly, are you allowed to take pictures and keep them in the house in a safe place um, without hanging them on the walls or in your phones? The issue of pictures is one of the most serious issues and one of the most serious sins that a Muslim can fall into. The Prophet ﷺ said, indeed the people who will suffer the worst punishment on the day of judgment will be the, those who make pictures. So we advise the brothers and the sisters not to make any pictures at all and not to take any pictures at all. And not to hang these pictures in your houses and not to print these pictures out. I will say that if 
you must take pictures or you feel a desperate need to take pictures, then my advice is to keep them digital, such as on the mobile phone or on the computer or on the camcorder, because it seems to me that digital pictures don't fall under the ruling because these are not permanent. They don't have any uh, permanence or any meaning. In other words, when I take a picture on my phone and I close the phone down, nothing remains of that picture within the memory of the phone except <coughs> zeros and ones. There's no real substance to it. So I would say that if you have to, and again, if you can avoid it, avoid it, but if you have to take pictures and you feel the need or you feel that you're taking them now and you want to replace your pictures on the wall with something, then scan them, keep them digitally, keep them on the computer, but don't show them permanently on the screen and don't, if you keep them on your phone, don't print them out, don't keep them in your house because the angels do not enter the house in which there is a dog or a picture. And Allah knows best. If you are possessed with jinn, will he leave you when he is done? If you are possessed with a jinn, will he leave you when he is done? They almost never leave you until you disbelieve or until you die. This is the general circumstance and the general sort of situation of those who are possessed by the jinn. Uh, generally, except for those who Allah has mercy upon, they don't leave you until they achieve their aim, such as disbelief, death, breaking up between husband and wife, whatever it may be, or, or the person dies. But of course, it can be removed through a ruqya shar'iyah, through permissible ruqya, through the recitation of the Qur'an, uh, and through the uh, recitation of the du'as of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam that he made for these circumstances. And this comes with complete trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and not trusting upon other than Allah azza wa jal and reciting the Qur'an, believing that it is the uncreated speech of Allah and believing that it is a shifa, a shifa, a cure for what is in the hearts and a cure for what is in the mind and a cure for what has afflicted the body. The Quran is a cure for every single kind of illness, whether it's physical, paranormal, supernatural, psychological, every kind of illness can be cured by the Quran. So a person recites the Quran, they trust upon Allah, they make dua and they do the prescribed adhkar and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will, with his permission, save them from this thing that they are afflicted with. When trying to pass on knowledge, does the shaitan amongst the jinn attack you, for example, in dreams or in any other way? The ways that the shaitan attack a person are varied, and it depends on the person and the individual. So there have been people who have been attacked by the shaitan when they tried to pass on knowledge. But the shaitan also would rather get the bigger picture. And for example, if there's a person who is teaching people, what is better for the shaitan? For the shaitan to attack them physically or for the shaitan to misguide them so they teach people something wrong. There's no doubt that the better means for the shaitan is to do the second. Because this is what is going to cause more misguidance for more people. So it's more likely that when someone passes on knowledge that the shaitan will try to misguide them in the knowledge they pass on than it is that the shaitan will try to physically harm them. Although both of these have been known and some of them are shaykh... Uh, were killed by various of the, you know, the shayateen, whether they are shayateen of, the, of mankind or shayateen of the jinn, because they taught the people knowledge, the likes of uh, al-allama ihsan illahi zahir rahimahullah ta'ala and others. And so it's not unknown for somebody to be physically harmed because they pass on knowledge. But in general, the, the, the shaytan will try to aim before physical harm, the shaytan will try to misguide the person so that they teach people things which are not correct. Okay. Are brother-in-laws allowed to reside with you? It's a question from one of the sisters. And if the wife has no choice, what is your advice for her in this situation? The Prophet ﷺ said the in-law is death. Meaning the brother-in-law, the sister-in-law is death. And this is not a light thing for the Prophet ﷺ to say this word, the in-law is death. This is a very, very, very serious thing. Now we're not going to say that it's impermissible for a brother-in-law to live with his sister-in-law, in, like that we can give a general ruling in that way, but we'll say it's very difficult for them to stick to the limits set by Allah. And yes, there may be certain houses where they can stick to the limits set by Allah because it's a very large house with completely separate entrances and there's never any mixing. But if there's ever a time when the, uh, the brother and sister-in-law are left together alone, or there's ever a time when you know the brother of the husband is left with the wife or the sister of the wife is left with the husband, then either the living arrangements need to be changed or they need to completely move out one way or the other because this is something which is very, very, very serious and this hadith that the in-law is death is something which is not to be taken lightly. 
It's something very, very, very serious. So if the wife has no choice but to live in that circumstance, then upon her is to fear Allah as much as she can, to do as much as she can with the house, to avoid mixing, to make sure that she wears her full hijab, meaning covering her face and her hands in front of her brother, brother-in-law, that she doesn't speak to him in her normal voice, and so on and so forth. This is all things, you know, she should take the brother-in-law to be more serious as a non-mahram than she would take a man in the street. So if she would not uncover her face for a man in the street, she should never dream of doing it for her brother-in-law because this hadith shows us that the brother-in-law is more strict and more severe than the issue of a stranger in the street. So the advice is that she should do the best she can to fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to stay fully covered, to try her best to keep in a separate room, and then inshallah ta'ala to try to encourage her husband as much as possible to move out. The wife, she has a right to separate accommodation. And this is her right in Islam, and nobody can deny this right. She, does, she has the right to demand her own separate accommodation in the Sharia. And yes, we know sometimes the husband isn't able to do it, and she has to be patient, but in general, she should be exercising this right if she can, and asking for her own separate accommodation in order that she can be from those people who fear Allah Azza wa Jal and earn the reward and the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and Allah knows best. Okay. If somebody is wearing a taweez, what is your advice in terms of what you can do? The issue of ta'weez, these things that are hung around the people's neck, this is something which is very, very, very severe. And this is something which if it doesn't lead a person, if it doesn't take a person outside of Islam, it takes them to the edge of coming outside of Islam. When the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, man allaqa tamimatan fakad ashraq, whoever ties a ta'weez around his neck has committed shirk. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sent the sahaba to cut the ta'weez from the necks of the camels. And the Prophet ﷺ found one of the companions and he had a ta'weez around his wrist. And the Prophet ﷺ cut it off and he said, cut it, for if you do not cut it, you will never be successful. Meaning you will not be successful in this life or in the next. So this issue is a very severe, severe issue. And it's obligatory upon a person to cut off any ta'weez that they have upon them. And there's no doubt that these ta'weez, whatever they say they are, they are nothing but coming close to the shaitan. And those people who follow me on Facebook will have seen several posts of ta'weez that have been opened that show you some of the things that are found within them. And likewise, on my Facebook, there is a detailed refutation of Sunni path in their claim that the ulama allow the wearing of ta'weez. There's a full refutation of this opinion uh, and their opinion that some of the sahaba allowed ta'weez. None of the sahaba allowed ta'weez. A'udhu billah. This is a statement, this is a statement, this is taqawwul ala sahaba. This is a statement, a lie against the sahaba radiallahu anhum. And all of the narrations which mention the sahaba approving of any kind of ta'weez from the Qur'an or other than the Qur'an, all of them are weak. And there is not one single authentic narration from the companions that they allow ta'weez in any way from the Qur'an or other than the Qur'an. Some of the tabi'een allowed ta'weez that was from the Qur'an alone, but none of the sahaba. All of the narrations to the sahaba are weak including the narration of Abdullah ibn Amr and the narration of Aisha radiallahu anhuma. So this is not something that a person is allowed to do and if they want to go on my Facebook, inshallah, they'll be able to find more details about the refutation of ta'weez and some of the pictures of ta'weez that have been opened to try to convince people to take these things off because wallahi, if you don't take it off, you will not be successful in this dunya and you will get nothing in the akhirah. You will not be successful in the akhirah either. So don't sell your dunya and your akhirah for the sake of some stupid piece of string that you tie around your neck. And they tell you that it is the Qur'an and I have a simple offer and it's like a you know, special offer and I do this all the time. I say to anyone, bring me your ta'weez that is from the Qur'an. I will open it up. If it is from the Qur'an, I'll give it back to you. Because it's never ever, I, I've, of all the ta- I've probably opened more than a thousand ta'weez. And from all of the ta'weez I've opened, I can count on two hands the number of ta'weez that were from the Qur'an. And in fact, I tell you a story, you might have heard me tell it before. I came to a person, they said, I've got a ta'weez. I said, let me see it. I said, they said it's from the Qur'an. I said it's unlikely going to be from the Qur'an. So I opened it up and I expected it to be full of the names of the shaitan like they usually are. And it was a printed ayah of the Qur'an, nothing else. Just a printed ayat al kursi. I showed it to them, the person became angry. They said, this man has ripped me off. Subhanallah, he's ripped me off. I asked him for a ta'weez, he's given me a printed ayah of the Qur'an. Subhanallah. This is something that honestly, these ta'weez that people say is the Qur'an, it is not the Qur'an. They're full of the names of the shaitan. Shaitan, help me, help me, help me, help me. And the person tells, it's just ayat al kursi. Look, that's all I just wrote. I wrote for you, Kulhu Allahu Ahad. And it says, there is no Allah. 
This is, what, this is the misguidance that these people are encouraging others towards. And like I said, inshallah, if you follow some of my notes and posts on Facebook, inshallah, there are more information about that, inshallah. Okay. I have one simple question here, and it is, what is innovation? Mm. Innovation, uh, in, a, in the sense of the sharia, is to do an action that was not authorized by the, or was not from the actions that were authorized by the Sharia, by the Quran, or by the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said in an authentic hadith narrated by Al Bukhari and Muslim from the hadith of Aisha radiallahu anha uh, that whoever man amina amalan laysa alayhi amruna fahuwa rad. Whoever does an action that is not in accordance with what we have brought will have it rejected. So it's not permissible for a Muslim to do an action that was not legislated either by the Qur'an or by the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So it's very important that you look at your actions and you make sure that all of your actions have a basis in the Book of Allah and the Sunnah of His Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the ijma' of the companions and so on and so forth. So in broadly, innovation is to do an action uh, with the intention of worship uh, of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala that was not done by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam or the companions Radiallahu Anhum and therefore it is something which is newly done, innovated. And that's what the word innovation or bid'ah means to do, it means to do something that does not have a previous example, to do something that wasn't done before. And so this is something that a person must avoid in the religion of Islam and Allah knows best. Okay. Any, any further questions? Uh, Brother Abdurrahman? Wa'iyak. Secondly, in respect of the oppression and the ignorance, the brothers in Guantanamo Bay at the moment who are undertaking a hunger strike, is this permissible in the Sharia? Taib. The first question regarding uh, the issue of um, Umar, radiallahu an, that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told us that the, when the shayateen saw Umar on a path that they would cross the road and take another path. And this was from the iman of Umar from the high level of iman that Umar had radiallahu an, that he radiallahu an, his iman was so high and his remembrance of Allah was so much that when the shayateen would come and see him approaching, they would move away from him and take another path. And this is the situation of the person who remembers Allah. When you remember Allah much and you do good deeds and you come close to Allah, the shaitan doesn't like to be around you and can't stand to be around you. And that's why you're going to find the more dhikr you do, the more coming close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you do, the more patience you have, you are going to find the shaitan be further and further away from you. Because the shaitan, they can't stand, or the shayateen, they can't stand to be around those people who have a high level of iman, and those people who remember Allah azza wa jal much. So it's about being patient and about remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And because of the level of iman of Umar, not his physical presence. It wasn't his physical presence that made the shaitan run away, but it was the level of his iman radiallahu anhu arda. The second question the brother had was regarding this issue of uh, prisoners uh, taking hunger strikes, uh, particularly something in Guant Guantanamo Bay regarding prisoners who are taking hunger strikes. Wallahu alam, I don't know uh, the ruling of uh, hunger strikes for prisoners and the different conditions of those things, inshallah. That's something that we should look for in the fatawa of Ahlul Ilm, inshallah. We should ask uh, some of the scholars regarding the permissibility generally of a Muslim doing hunger strikes. There is obviously serious concerns with regard to the fact that you know, your body is, like, is an amana from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and it's not permissible for someone to do something which would harm it. But you have to look at that in the context of you know, this, the situation a person is in and you have to ask that question to the scholars of Islam and I don't know the answer to that, inshallah. Okay. Brother Abu Habib. Assalamu alaikum. Wa wa There is a hadith in which the Prophet sallallahu alaihi sorry I'll repeat the question the question is people who eat in restaurants where alcohol is served the food is halal but there is alcohol being served there is a hadith that a Muslim does not eat at a table where alcohol is served. And as far as I can see from the 
opinions of the scholars in Islam. This refers to actually sitting down at the table and having alcohol being drunk in front of you at the same place. However, there's no doubt that being in a restaurant where people are drinking alcohol on the next table gives you a degree of that meaning. I don't think it comes under the hadith, or I'm not going to say I don't think, but the scholars of Islam generally from the fatawa, because this is something I looked into a few weeks ago, most of the scholars, they don't include this within the hadith. So they don't say that if someone is drinking alcohol on the next table, it's exactly the same as somebody drinking alcohol in front of you, but there's no doubt that it's a similar kind of meaning or it gives you a, a degree of fear. So there's no doubt that a Muslim who fears Allah and does his best to fear Allah, he tries to avoid these places, he tries to avoid places where... Alcohol is being served, especially because it's cooperating with those people, encouraging them and so on and so forth. And in reality, he has to advise them to get rid of that alcohol uh, and, you know, inshallah, to try to avoid those places where alcohol is served and to go to those places where alcohol isn't served in the hope that this will remind the owners and will encourage the owners to, inshallah, leave this, leave this uh, particular thing that they're doing, inshallah. But as for the issue of it being absolutely haram, then Allah Azza wa knows best. This is not something I could come to the conclusion for, but it's definitely something that a Muslim should try to avoid as much as possible. Okay, our little brother there. Why not? MashaAllah, tabarakallah, wa alayhi salam wa rahmatullah. The brother, he asked, why is it that we can't hear shaitan whispering? We can feel shaitan whispering, but we can't hear shaitan whispering. I think one of the reasons this is, and Allah knows best, that Allah knows really best the reason why, but that when we can't hear the actual words of the shaitan, it makes it more difficult for us to pass the test. Because when you can hear someone saying to you, be misguided, Turn away from the path of Allah. That makes you sort of realize that, okay, I'm being misguided now. But when it's just a feeling that you get, it's harder for you to resist. So it's more of a test for you. And it makes you have to concentrate more and you have to think a little bit more and be a bit more awake. And it's like the, like the issue of hearing the punishment of the grave. If you could hear the punishment of the grave, you wouldn't fear, you wouldn't uh, you know, disobey Allah and there wouldn't be this test that there is now if you could hear the punishment of the grave because you would be able to see in reality what's happening so sometimes Allah keeps things hidden and we can't hear them so that it's more of a test for us and so that we can sort of uh, have a test and see if we're going to behave or if we're not going to behave and Allah knows best can shaitan take the form of a human being some of the shayateen can take the form of a human being yes this is no doubt about this this is authentically mentioned in several places in the Sunnah, including on the day of Badr, that Iblis took the form of an old man and he encouraged the people to, uh, to uh, uh, sort of go forth against the Prophet Sallallahu in the Battle of Badr. Uh, and likewise, it is mentioned that generally there are certain types of the shaitan that can take the form of animals. There are certain types of the shaitan that can take the form of human beings. So I think this is something that we can say is definitely true. Uh, Brother Abed, um, what yak? Um, the Taweeth, I said, if you just go on my, onto my Facebook, uh, which is all my contact details are just Muhammad Tim. So I don't know if there is this, let me see how the spelling is on there. Yeah. So the same spelling is, is on, the, uh, on the posters, M-U-H-A-M-M-A-D-T-I-M. And if you look for that on Facebook or you, you know, like any of the other sites, inshallah, you'll find my uh, contact details. And on my Facebook uh, page, I posted a few pictures of ta'weed that were opened and there's a refutation on there about some of the people who said that the Sahaba used to wear ta'weed and things like that, inshallah. Okay. Brother Abdurrahman. Mm. No doubt. No <laughs> doubt. Regarding pictures, we need, we should have made this point. The brother made a very good point that when we were talking about pictures, the conversation that we had about pictures was about pictures of things with souls, i.e., pictures of living beings, animate pictures, yeah, i.e., pictures of human beings and pictures of animals, not pictures of trees, not pictures of mountains, not pictures of, you know, pictures of things with faces. Basically, that was what, or with heads, that was what we were talking about when we came to talk about pictures. Just had a, another question text through. Can you get paralyzed by jinn? And if so, what can you do or should you do? Mm. No doubt you can get paralyzed by the jinn, and this is a very common uh, 
sort of complaint people have with regard to the jinn. And when you feel this paralysis come up on, on board, you can try to remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you can't recite something with your mouth like Ayatul Kursi or Qul Hu Allahu Ahad, then try to recite it in your heart. Make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if you can do it with your tongue. But if your tongue is still paralyzed, then do it with your heart. And remain calm. Don't worry about it. At the end of the day, it will pass. Simply, you know, remember Allah Azza wa Jal in your heart and inshaAllah ta'ala. If you are able, remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on your tongue. If you're able to move a part of your body, then you can blow into your hands and sort of move your hand over your body and inshallah this will relieve the paralysis. Likewise, you can, if you have some water that's been recited upon, you can put it on top of you. And you may find that if you suffer this in sleep a lot, that you can recite on some olive oil, recite Ayatul Kursi and the last three surahs of the Quran on some olive oil and put it onto yourself before you go to sleep and inshallah this will help as will doing the adhkar uh, of going to sleep like reading Ayatul Kursi and Suratul Mulk and some of the other ayat that you're recommended to read قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدُ قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ الْفَلَقُ قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ النَّاسِ Reading these ayat before you go to sleep inshallah will also help uh, someone suffering from sleep paralysis inshallah ta'ala yeah. Our young brother there? Uh, this isn't nothing to do with the topic you know Gog and Magog? Yes Yeah, in the internet I read that the guy who did it you know like made the bar barrier his name was Dukul Naim Yes oh. That's a very, very good question. MashaAllah, tabarakallah. A question about Ya'juj and Ma'juj. And the brother, he said that he read on the internet that Dhul Qarnayn, who was the one who made the barrier between Ya'juj and Ma'juj, was Alexander the Great. And that's a very common thing, and it's said by a lot of people. But what we say about this is, anything that we read on the internet about Islam, we say one thing. Do we have evidence for it from the Qur'an and the Sunnah? If we don't have evidence for it from the Qur'an or the Sunnah, have we got any proof that it didn't happen? So we've got one of three things. We've either got an evidence from the Qur'an and the Sunnah, or we've got an evidence from the Qur'an or the Sunnah that it's definitely not true, or we don't have any evidence that it's true, or any evidence that it's not true. So how do we act? If we've got a proof from the Qur'an and the Sunnah that it's true, we believe in it. If we've got a proof from the Qur'an and the Sunnah that it's not true, we say, no way, it's not true. If we don't have a proof for or against, and we say, well, it's possible that Alexander the Great was Dhul Qarnayn, maybe. I mean, a lot of things that are said about Alexander the Great are not good. Like, they, don't, they say a lot of bad things about him, so Allah knows best, but it's possible those things that are said are wrong. So we say Allah knows best. Whenever we're dealing with things that we don't have proof for, we just say Allah knows best. So I would say there is some evidence against it, and some of the evidence against it is that a lot of things are narrated about Alexander the Great that are very negative. But we don't have a proof that those things are really true or not. So we say Allah Azza wa knows best. But we don't have any proof to say that it's true. So we shouldn't say that Dhul Qarnayn is Alexander the Great. And we probably shouldn't say that he wasn't Alexander the Great until we have a proof one way or the other. And maybe if somebody has more knowledge about it, they can say, no, definitely he wasn't because of this, this and this. But we say that as long as we don't have any proof for or any proof against, we say Allah knows best. Yeah, brother Abed. What yak? Reminder about um, sleeping early and fajr. As fajr gets earlier. Sleeping early and salatul fajr. There's no doubt that salatul fajr is from the most important of the prayers. After salatul asr, it seems to be the most important prayer after salatul asr. And Salatul Fajr is one of the signs that you are not a munafiq. Because from the signs of the munafiqeen is that they're unable, the hypocrites, they're unable to pray Salatul Fajr in the congregation. And the salah has been given to you at fixed times. Allah Azza wa Jalla says, Inna salata kanat ala al-mu'minina kitab al The prayer has been made for the believers at fixed times. So it's obligatory upon every single man to pray Salatul Fajr in the masjid as much as he is able to do so. Remember, with regard to the masjid, the hadith of the blind man who came to the Prophet wasallam, And he said, O Messenger of Allah, I'm a blind man and I do not have a guide who will take me to the masjid. I don't have anyone to carry me or to lead me to the masjid. And in another narration, my house is far away and between my house and the masjid are dangers for me that I fear that I will fall. I fear that I will fall into, for example, holes or valleys and I feel that I will fall into. So the Prophet ﷺ initially gave him permission to miss the prayer. Then he called him and he said, Hal nida? Do you hear the call to the prayer? He said, yes, I hear the call to the prayer. He said, Fa'ajib, so respond to it. 
So if the Prophet ﷺ didn't allow a blind man who has no guide, whose house is far away, who has dangers on the road, he didn't allow him to miss the Fajr prayer in the masjid because he heard the adhan, then it's not allowed for us to miss the Fajr prayer in the masjid as much as we are able to do so. And yes, I know we don't all hear the adhan, and sometimes we live very, very far away, but as much as possible. When you pray Fajr in the jama'ah, you are under the protection of Allah until the evening comes. When you don't pray Fajr in the jama'ah, you have no protection for, from the shaitan for that day. So it's very, very important for the brothers to aim to be praying Fajr in the masjid. And for all of the Muslims, brothers and sisters, unconditionally to be praying Fajr on time. Now there's no doubt that a person says, if I sleep in, Allah doesn't hold me to account. Because it's a natural thing, I'm not awake. Rufi al-Qalam and Thalath, three people will not be taken to account. One of them is al-Na'imu hatta yastayqid. And the sleeping person until he wakes up. So I know I'm not going to be taken to account. We say yes, but there's a condition. The condition is that before you went to sleep, you didn't do something that would make you miss Fajr. So for example, if you stay up until half an hour before Fajr, and then you go to sleep. <coughs> and then you say, well, the pen, the pen wasn't writing my bad deeds. The pen wasn't writing your bad deeds when you were asleep, but the pen wrote the bad deed when you stayed up until half an hour before Fajr began, and you knew that you weren't going to wake up for it. So you are blameworthy for it in that sense. So it's very important that you, you, know, you follow the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu The Prophet Sallallahu did not used to spend a lot of time after Isha. He did sometimes spend time after Isha, but very rarely. And the majority of the narrations mention that he did not like to speak to people after Isha, and he did not like to have gatherings after Isha except occasionally. And he would go and he would sleep early Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam so that he was able to wake up for the night prayer and so that he was able to wake up for the Fajr prayer. So it's very important that you do your very, very, very best to wake up for the Fajr prayer at a minimum and at an ideal that you're praying Fajr in the masjid so that you are under the protection of Allah until the evening comes. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us the tawfiq to be able to do that. Ameen. Can we just take this one final question because I know time's getting on now. Um, Okay, uh, some of the rulings and, the, and the, the, the question is about ikhtilat, about mixing between men and women uh, and the issues and some of the times when it might be allowed uh, and some of the rulings regarding it. Uh, and specifically, is there any difference if they are your relatives? Islam doesn't make any difference at all between relatives and between non-relatives. Islam makes a difference between mahram and non-mahram. And not every relative is a mahram for you. So a mahram are the relatives that you're forbidden from marrying. So for example, you can't marry your sister, you can't marry your mother, you can't marry your grandmother, you can't marry your daughter. Those are your, you can't marry your paternal aunt or your maternal aunt and so on and so forth. So those are your maharim, your mahram. And those, there is no problem with you being alone with them. There is no problem with them having their hijab off in front of you as long as they are wearing modest dress. So they shouldn't be wearing particularly tight clothing or they shouldn't be wearing revealing clothing. But as long as their dress is sort of modest, then there's no problem with that. But as for your cousin, for example, your cousin is not a mahram for you. And the proof for that is that you marry people. A lot of people marry their cousins. The Prophet wasallam married one of his cousins, alayhi salatu wasalam. So there's nothing about marrying your cousin and therefore your cousin is not a mahram for you. Likewise, there are other relatives that may come in. Uh, your, for example, your brother's wife. For example, your uncle, your blood uncle's wife. Again, these are all people who are not ma a mahram for you. And therefore, the, the rules of Islam apply. Islam doesn't say relative or non-relative, but Islam says mahram or non-mahram. The first thing that you're trying to avoid is any mixing at all. Because Islam commands you to avoid anything that might lead to something further. But if there is a necessity for you to mix or a need, because not always a necessity, but a need, like for example, uh, they are, you know, uh, there's only one room in the house and they've come to visit, then at least you must make sure there is nothing which we call khalwa. And khalwa is where a man and a woman who are not mahram are alone together. And there are different types of khalwa, or two different types of khalwa. One type of khalwa is where they are alone completely, such to the extent that they would be able to commit something haram. And that is the more serious. And the other type is the type where they are alone, but they would not be able to do so. And this is still haram, but it's less serious. But you're trying to avoid all of these. So even if it just means that you're in the kitchen and she's in the kitchen, but the door is open, even then you should try to avoid that. 
Because this is still a type of khalwa, even if it is not a complete khalwa where you could do something haram because the door is open, but it's still a type of khalwa which you try to avoid. You also try to avoid unnecessarily looking at them because it's not allowed for you to look at them. Like the Prophet ﷺ said, uh, al wa thani alayk, the first time you, you glance at someone by accident, you know, if you open the door and it's a woman and you sort of look at her, you look away, the first time that you see her, that's forgiven because it wasn't your choice. The second time that you choose to look at her, it's a sin for you. So you try not to look at her in the way that you talk to her, you keep it very professional and businesslike. There's nothing wrong if, you pay, if your cousin picks up the phone, Salaam alaikum wa salam, how are you? I hope you're okay. How's your mom? How's your dad? Could I speak to my auntie, please? Could I speak to you? There's nothing wrong with that, but you keep it professional. You don't keep it to the point, are oh, you okay, you know, I saw you last week, you were looking really good, and you know, so on and so forth. You keep it professional, yeah, and you keep it business-like. So just, salam alaikum, how are you, mashallah, tabarakallah, I hope you're well, how did your exams go, everything was okay, mashallah, can I speak to your mom, please? Like something, so you keep it short and you keep it professional, inshallah. So those are some of the rulings of uh, ikhtilat, and as general, we try to avoid as much mixing and mingling of men and women as possible. So if you can keep men and women in separate rooms, that's the best thing. Because at the end of the day, even if you are a religious family and you try to stick to the limits, eventually you're going to get closer. A little bit by little bit, you know, step by step, until maybe something might happen. So it's always best to keep things separate. But there are times when you can't. You know, you come on Eid day, there's only one room in the house, everyone sat there. At least you, you, know, you make sure you're dressed, dressed modestly. The lady, she's not wearing makeup. She's wearing her full hijab in front of you. You're not sat just chatting to each other, looking at each other. You know, any conversation is just kept brief and sort of business-like. And you know, you try not to be alone with her, even if the door is open or something like that. And you fear Allah and you show her that respect because that's from the respect that you show people, your fellow Muslim, and the respect that she shows you, inshallah. And there's no doubt families that practice that, they have a much more successful and a happy family life, alhamdulillah. And Allah knows best. Okay, we are uh, nearing Maghrib prayer, inshallah. I would encourage everybody to stay in the masjid. I think we'll end it there because I think we've really worked the sheikh hard today. And jazakallah khair. And also on, on behalf of Dali Dawa, I want to extend our appreciation and duas to the sheikh and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect him in his health, wealth and iman. Ameen. He's been a great supporter of our Dawa. Um, next week, Inshallah, Brother Husnain will be visiting us and uh, his talk will be on calling on others besides Allah. Um, what I want to say is that we have these talks every week in an attempt, inshallah, that we take lesson from them. So hopefully you know, we can go away and try and implement some of the teachings, some of the messages there and become better Muslims. And one of the ways that we can do that today is that several weeks ago, one of the brothers here, Abdul Rahman, who is present here today, did a talk on charity. He, inshallah, will be leaving on Wednesday, if all going well. Um, given the recent fundraising that uh, has been undertaken for, uh, for our brothers and sisters in Syria. And this is another opportunity and a final opportunity for you to contribute to that worthy cause. And if you want to do so, you know, you know, please see Abdul Rahman or myself uh, after this talk. Also, we've started to produce some CDs now. Um, and so they're uh, available at the stall uh, just outside the main door here. And also all the talks are um, uploaded onto uh, YouTube. And we would ask you to, you know, donate gen generously to the uh, to the dawah. Is um, is from your contributions that these events are possible? Okay, jazakallah khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.